internet, kfugradio.org. I'm Mike Thornton. This is Public Process, nine minutes past the top of the hour. That hour is 11 a.m. here on the north coast of the north coast of California. Who knows what it is where you are, somewhere on the globe, listening to your community radio station, KFUG. All righty, listen, I am really thrilled to be joined by our first guest today, Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door Clinic, Cynthia Barcelo. Cynthia, thank you for being with us on Public Process. Hi, good morning, Mike. Buenos dias. Thank yeah, buenos dias. <laughs> ¿Cómo está? Muy bien. ¿Cómo estás? Uh, Bien, también. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you for your patience with my broken bad Spanish. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's wonderful. <laughs> Cynthia, thank you. Let me ask you to move a little bit closer to that microphone, get comfortable, and, okay. and be there so people can hear what you have to say. So, Cynthia, we're going to talk about... Latino health coordinator and what that is and how you go about doing it and the role and the function it plays at Open Door and in our community. But the first thing that I always try to do with our guests is to to help our listeners get a little bit of a sense of, you know, who are you as a human being and why do you do these things that you do? What are what are the values and the things in your life that motivate you to do this type of work? So so when I ask that question, who is Cynthia Barcelo, you know, what, how do you respond to that? Um, so when I introduce myself to people, I like to also um, introduce um, uh, my parents, where they come from, because they created me, and um, I'm very connected with my parents. Um, so my mother was born in Mexico, and my father was born in El Salvador. Um, and they both had pretty rough childhoods growing up. Um, they were not wealthy at all. Um, they both individually had very difficult struggles um, that they had to go through, even as very young children, um, and into their adolescence. And um, you know, and and a lot of what I do, I think, stems from that. Hearing their stories and where they come from. And how different their life is from mine, and how privileged I am. Let, let me ask you, if you don't mind, sure. is to to talk, if you can, and if you will, a, a little bit about maybe what some of those struggles sure. were, because I, I think a, a lot of people in the United States don't really have much of a sense of some of the things that happen in other places around the world. And and, and I happen to know a little bit about El Salvador mm-hmm. because I did some reporting from there around the U.S. Army School of the Americas and a lot of the death squad activity that was happening and is still happening. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about your parents and yeah. those struggles? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my mom, um, she is one of 10 children. Um, and she was about, I believe, 10 years old when my grandfather passed away. So my, my grandmother um, had to raise 10 children all on her own. Um, you know, they, she would work from sunrise to sundown. Um, she, it was all up to her to have to support her children and take care of them as best as she could. Um, and so my mother, you know, was, didn't have the nicest clothes she didn't have the latest shoes she you know grew up very poor um you know but still fortunately fortunately for her um in a very loving home where love was always shared from her mother and her father and um you know even though she was 10 years old when her father passed away she still remembers him so much and so much of the love that he gave her and um the songs that you know he would he would sing on his pretend guitar with her and um you know and she still carries that around with her so even though she financially wasn't in a good place um she was surrounded by love a lot so she she was lucky in that um my father in el salvador um same you know he was his family was very poor um when he was um, very young, uh, I believe 13 or 14, uh, he was forced to be in the military. Mm-hmm. Um, so he was basically taken from his family and forced to be in the military. 
Um, he was lucky enough to be able to come to the United States, I believe, at 17 years old um, as a refugee, trying to escape all of that violence and, you know, trying to live a better life and not have to, you know, do what the military was forcing him to do. Um, and he... He's, you know, my he's one of my biggest inspirations to this date. Um, he's very extremely hardworking. He's done construction since before I was born, so about 87, 88. He's been doing construction. Um, he's helped to construct, like, wonderful things that, you know, people can enjoy. He helped build um, the stadium in Arizona and um you know banks and schools and homes and you know so much he's done in his life um and he you know he didn't let um his past define him um he was able to um find god and be able to move on from that trauma that he had because he did have a lot of trauma when he um first came to the united states Um, But he was able to move past that and to, you know, support his children and support his wife and live a good life and um, give so much back to um, so many people. So So what I'm hearing in everything that you're saying is is a couple of things. Mm -hmm. You know, one is this sort of central premise that love and genuine love can really act as a a ballast to a lot of other difficulties, financial and others, that someone can come out of an incredibly traumatized past and environment and find a way to transcend that and and move on to, to something better. And through hard work, actually contribute not only to their family but also to the community at large and it sounds like and and from what i know about you i i i can see all of that in you and it sounds like in many ways those are sort of the guiding principles that you operate by in the work that you're doing in the community is that a fair statement yes yes absolutely um I, you know, there's so much trauma even within the United States that children live through every single day. Um, And it's difficult. It's difficult to see when, you know, children have to go through, you know, these terrible situations in their lives that they have no control over. Um, And then, you, you know, you hear those stories of, you know, I made it. I did it. I went to college. I have a child and I'm a good mother. I... Um, you know, I'm an owner of a restaurant, you know, these wonderful stories, um, you know, and, but unfortunately there are those times when, you know, the stories are, you know, not the best, you know, and, and sometimes trauma can completely overcome you and you either don't have the resources around you to get out of it or, you know, you, you mentally, you are not able to come out of it. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the reasons as well. Um, you know, to he- because I love hearing the good stories, I do the work, but also because I know that not everybody will be as lucky as my parents to come out of that trauma. Um, and, you know, I, I want to be able to help people to, to come out of it. You know, even though they didn't maybe make the best choices in life, um, you know, there's always some type of trauma that somebody has that we don't know about. And who are we to judge them? We should not be judging them. We should be helping them in any way that we can. We're talking with Cynthia Barcello, who is the Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door Clinic. You are tuned to KFUG Crescent City. This is Public Process. I'm Mike Thornton. Cynthia, I want to talk more about trauma and how it affects the people that you work with because I'm hearing you say that's a part of it Uh, and then I also want to at some point touch on how do professional health care providers and others work to make sure that that trauma doesn't destroy them as well does that make sense but I want to jump to something because I know you and I were at a board of supervisors meeting a number of months back and it was related to 
one member of the Board of Supervisors wanting to opt out of the California mm -hmm. Values Act and using some sort of stereotypical descriptions of Latino people and particularly MS-13. Mm -hmm. And I know you had some very passionate things to say about not judging people by what they look like. And could would you talk a little bit about that, if you don't yeah. mind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, um, that wouldn't be the first person that I, you know, run into that has this, you know, horrible depiction of Latino people in general. Um, growing up in Arizona, um, you know, we would hear and see on the news stories of Joe Arpaio and how he was just, you know, just basically um, persecuting Latino people for looking Latino, um, which is, you know, I, I still to this day don't know what it what it's like to have to look Latino. I don't know what that, you know, entails. I don't know, like, the specifications of the looks that you would have to have to be considered Latino. Um, you know, and, it, and it's it's really sad to see that even in this day and time, um, it's like something normal that should that is oh yeah they look latino they must not have you know documentation you know it's it's so sad to hear that because you know these people are first of all in office in some form of office and they're judging people so not only are they not representing the people that they need to be representing um they're you know they're just going about what is in their mind and you know, passing judgment, which, you know, is not something that we should even have the right to do. You know, we're human. Everybody is human. How can you, you know, say things, hurtful things about a certain type of people for looking, quote unquote, a certain way? Um, you know, and, and it's it's not OK for this to continue to happen. Um, you know, it's happened since the beginning of our country and, and, you know, it has to stop it. It just, we can't continue to, to live that way. Let, let me ask you something that is going to be fairly personal. Okay. When we hear all of this rhetoric, whether it's locally from a few sources, whether it's in the state, whether it's nationally about Latino people. How does that affect you as a person? I mean, it's, I'm sitting here saying, I'm going, you know, because like I, I can't really get inside mm -hmm. that, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I have an intellectual understanding, but hearing that stuff all the time yeah um it does affect me i'm for me actually i don't feel that you know of course obviously i feel attacked um but at the same time i don't i don't take it to heart personally like you know that what they say um about latino people isn't going to make me act any different i'm not going to try and be you know, something I'm not, I'm not going to try and be American, more American than, you know, you're already American. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm not going to try and be a different person. Um, so say what they say, I will always be myself and I will carry the stories of my ancestors with me. Um, but, <laughs> um, it does hurt me that they would be willing to talk about my family my friends, my teachers, my elementary school Your principal, children? My children, exactly. Um, you know, to, just to pass judgment on them, uh, it's, it's, you know, pretty infuriating because they know nothing about, they know nothing about their story. And they know nothing about their struggle. They know nothing about what wonderful people Latino people are. Um, you know, and, and it hurts to hear that it hurts to hear that you know oh these people are rapists and you know that's that's not you know true i mean yes of course obviously it happens but it happens in every culture right and absolutely every culture there's not one culture that escapes you know having people that are not mentally stable it doesn't escape anybody um so to be like you know targeted it's it just 
gives me more fuel to do the work that I do and help more people to understand that, no, you know, that's what people say about us, but that's not what we are. You know, no matter what anybody says, just continue to do live your life in the good way that you do. And you do what you have to do. You get things done. And, you know, don't don't let that bring you down. Don't let that um, affect you or make you lose sleep over it what you know these certain individuals are saying about you you know that you're a good person you continue to be a good person and and you and show the world that you are a good person we're speaking with cynthia barcello who is the latino health coordinator for open door clinic this is public process i'm mike thornton cynthia i think this is a a good segue to talk about Mm -hmm. what you do as a latino health coordinator and and part of it because you know, and, and once again, I mean, going on, you know, we're talking about your, your, you are the Latino health coordinator. So you're working with our Latino community and other people as well. And, and I'm thinking that, you know, you're not much different than most people, right? And, and so, so they're coming in to get health care and all that stuff with all of these things going on in their lives in with this political and social and community environment for good, bad, or indifferent that's going on as well. And I'm sure that that has impacts on their ability to access health care, their health, and then um, and their ability to, to fully uh, implement all of that in their lives and the lives of their children. Mm-hmm. Right? Does yes. that make sense? Yes. So talk about what you do, if you don't mind, as the Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door. Okay, so my official job title is Latino Health Coordinator slash um, Promotora. So basically like a promoter, and we're promoting health. Um, We fall under the category of community health workers, which uh, is basically um, somebody who helps people navigate through the medical system, um, how everything works, how to pay bills, who to contact if, you know, your insurance isn't going through. Um, you know, and we do, you know, a lot of different, uh, things, um, under our job title. Um, the department that I work under is member services at Del Norte Community Health Centers, which is part of Open Door. Um, and, um, I really love working for Open Door, um, because it's, it was formed out of a place of non-judgment. You know, our founder, um, was... An incredible man and you know his legacy will live on forever um, you know and and to be able to serve people you know what whatever you know income they may have whatever background they may have you know in any form that we can help them that's it's amazing to be able to work for a company that is you know an open door to everybody everybody's welcome um, and I love I love working for for open door um a part of what i do specifically is i'm help people apply for health insurance um we usually do it through covered california um and if people qualify for medical then um it goes through the county and um, we're able to help through that process as well for people who don't know what covered california is what what is that actually covered california is um what some people would call obamacare okay health exchange for the state Mm -hmm. okay yes absolutely um and i love working i love being able to help people apply for health insurance and um kind of guide them through the system because it can be tricky even even for somebody who's certified to do it it can be tricky sometimes um so to be able to help people find like okay uh do you see the doctor often what you know how much are you able to pay a month and you know these are your different options um, you know, just helping to navigate them, I feel a lot of the times is take so much stress off of their backs. And some people come in and say, I've been trying to do it online and I can't figure it out. Um, you know, and so to be able to help them through that process is, is, is a really great thing. Um, and it empowers them to be able to um, have that knowledge to choose what the right plan is, is for them and their families. Well, one of the things that that strikes me the the healthcare system in our country is so complicated and and 
ridiculous. That's just my opinion. It's just ridiculously complicated. And, and so often we are asking people who, I mean, they do, as you say, they don't have expertise in this. And on top of that, very often they're sick mm -hmm. and stressed and all of that stuff and saying, okay, now you figure out, on top of everything else that's going on in your life, figure out this ridiculously overly complicated thing that even professionals have a hard time trying to address. And that's where you come in mm -hmm. to, to help them to try to, to navigate that system. Yes, right. yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we try and have our office set up as welcoming as possible um, to help our patients or even clients. They, some, and sometimes they're not even patients of our clinic. Um, they're just, you know, people in the community that need help, you know, navigating that system. Um, uh, I do agree with you that <laughs> it is a bit ridiculous, um, but that's why I'm very grateful to have this position where I'm able to help them navigate that very difficult you know, strenuous situation for them. We're speaking with Cynthia Barcello, Latina Health Coordinator for Open Door. I just call it Open Door because <laughs> that works for me. Uh, you know, Del Norte Community Health Center, that's cool, but I just go with Open Door. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Mike Thornton. This is public process. So. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'll just, I'll, just, you know, I'll say it. I, you can agree or disagree. We've got to get out of this ridiculous healthcare system the way it is. We need single payer health. We, you know, I, I'm sorry. You know, if if some multi gazillionaire private health insurance CEO has to figure out how to live on the 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 million dollars they've got in the bank. They can figure that out. We need to move away from that and start doing something that makes sense for people who actually need health care. I think that's single payer. There, I've said it. Let's just move on. <laughs> so, so Cynthia, in, in addition to doing that kind of detailed technical work, you and others at Open Door also do public health events, right? Yes, absolutely. And I will probably promote some of our... But, but, hey, <laughs> some of you're our a promoter. <laughs> That's your job, right? Yes. Um, so, uh, yes. So one of the things that we do as community health workers is um, host... Um, and help out with health fairs. Um, we have quite a few of health fairs coming up pretty soon. Um, we have our multicultural wellness fair um, at Smith River School. That'll be on Sunday, May 5th from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Um, that day we will have cultural dancers um, and we're going to have yummy food. We're going to have activities for the entire family. Um, and it's, I have a feeling it's going to be really great. Smith River is also doing their spring concert that day. Um, so if you would like to be a part of that, you can go ahead and get in contact with me or Mr. Jones. Um, he's a very popular guy. If you haven't met him just yet, you probably will meet him. <laughs> nice. um, also, we have the uh, Women's Health Fair coming up. Um, that is hosted at Del Norte Community Health Center. That's on Friday, May 17th from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, it's hosted there in our big conference room. Um, and, you know, it's basically targeted for um, women who are uninsured, but any anyone is welcome to come. Any woman is welcome to come. Um, we give gifts and prizes, and we try and help uh, the women as a whole, you know, it's not necessarily just like one um, resource that we provide. We have different um, people coming in with different resources and um, just trying to help our patients, you know, with different things that affect their health. Uh, and, and let me ask you, I mean, when we're, I mean, I mean, some things are obvious. I mean, but when we're talking about issues around women's health, I mean, it's a whole myriad of of you know physical social economic status issues that all sort of combine right i mean it's absolutely. it's it's not just the biological difference yes. in bodies right absolutely can you talk to that a little sure. bit absolutely um so part of what we're doing for the women's health fair are free pap smears um and also um 
you know, if, if you do need an appointment, you can make a, an appointment in the future to see a provider. Um, but I mean, the people that the other people that will be attending are, you know, the domestic violence program. Um, that's something that that affects. I mean, it affects everybody. Sure. But specifically for women, I feel like um, we have such a strong role, especially if we have children, um, you know, where we need to get in a better situation and a better, you know, for our children specifically. Um but also for ourselves, you know, and a lot of the times we focus more as women on our families, on our husbands, our children, our pets, and most of the time we are the last ones that we think about. Right. Um, and that can bring quite a bit of um, distress for some women, and they don't even know it. They are under... Uh, sometimes even anxiety and they don't even know it because they just have to keep going, keep going. I have to get, you know, dinner done. I have to do the laundry. I have to get the kids to practice. I have to, you know, so many things that we have to do as mothers and women. Um, and we, we tend to forget about ourselves. Um, and I love this fair because, um, it focuses on women and mothers and daughters and grandmothers. And this is what, you know, you need to do for yourself. You need to take care of yourself. You should do yoga once in a while or some type of physical activity that speaks to you, something that you personally want to get into. Um, and, and I love the purpose of this fair for women to be able to focus on themselves. We're talking with Cynthia Barcello, Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door Clinic. My name is Mike Thornton. This is Public Process. You're tuned to KFUG Crescent City. So a couple of questions come to mind, Cynthia. I mean, I think in... Let me say this the way I really mean it, okay? okay? I think a lot of what you've described about the role of women goes across cultures. I think women have been pushed into those types of roles in general. And I guess what I want to ask, is it any more so or less so in the Latino community and culture? Does that make sense yes. what I'm asking? Yes. Um, I guess it kind of depends, especially even with like age groups. Um, I think like younger Latinas like myself, um, especially like um, – first generation here in the united states it's different for us it's generational yes. yeah. yeah absolutely um it's different for us than it is for our mothers um a lot of our mothers are still very um like you know the housewife and they have to get everything done they have to basically run the house themselves um and usually the the husbands tend to work um i think with uh, the younger generation um i feel that uh a lot of us feel a lot more um, empowered to, you know, work ourselves and bring home the bread ourselves. Um, a lot of the times we have to, you know, sometimes, you know, you don't, younger uh, women don't have their husbands or they don't have, you know, a partner that they can rely on. So they have to bring home, you know, their income for their kids, you know, and, and they have to run their, their own home. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's good to see that, um, we're becoming more um, empowered, you know, financially and, you know, just being able to go to college to um, do so many things that our mothers necessarily weren't um, able to do, you know, because of the situation that they were in. And just to be able to um, go in a direction that our Mothers or grandmothers never foresaw. They right. never. They would have never dreamed that you know a woman would be running for president. Right. The cultural parameters yeah. Yeah. basically said these things are outside mm -hmm. of your ability to experience, yeah. and you know you you can't question that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so the other thing that I I was thinking about is you know you were talking about your role primary role as helping people navigate the the complicated healthcare system but i can imagine that when people come in looking for assistance to do that other issues come up as well yes like domestic violence and other things 
Can you talk about that and, and what happens when that occurs? Absolutely. Um, for There's a, a certain, uh, I don't know, I guess... Um, Certain folks come in because they don't speak English. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of the times when they come in and they don't speak English and they're trying to apply for health insurance, there's a lot of other things that they need help with, with translation, with interpretation. Um, you know, it could be anything from filling out their DMV application and, you know, they're just not sure quite how to do it. We can sit with them and um, fill out those forms for them. Um, you know, if somebody is looking for more information on how to, you know, file for a divorce, you know, but they just don't have, you know, anybody to go with them because they don't speak the language. Um, we can, you know, go to the courthouse and, you know, help them find the paperwork that they need and talk to them, you know, translate what it's, what the process is going to be like and um, give them an idea and prepare them of, you know, what that, you know, process is going to be like. Um, and, you know, and it could be basically, you know, there's a plethora of things that we can that we can help people with interpretation, with translation, um, that are not necessarily like, oh, you know, these are your medications or this is the, your, you know, appointment time or date. There's lots of different things that um, affect affect our patients and the community as a whole. Um, and so for those patients, it's nice to be able to um, go with them and translate for them. And, and it's a learning process for us as well. Um, you know, there's different, you know, places that we've gone that I had no idea existed. And now I know because, you know, I, I was able to translate for this person. And, and for many of these folks, I mean, I would think in some ways you're almost the first point of contact it's like oh now i'm here i'm in the office with somebody who speaks my language who actually understands <laughs> what i'm trying to say to them and and who knows what can yeah. come out of that conversation and you sort of have to be able to be flexible enough mm -hmm. to deal with whatever that may be yes right? yes yes absolutely um uh, sometimes people do come with to us with um, you know really uh, hard stories, things that they're going through right now that are very difficult for them. Um, and I like to think that you know we welcome them even if they do have you know those problems with them. Um, and we try and and find solutions for them. I mean, we're not you know their doctors. We're not you know like any other type of professional, but you know, we can get them there and we can help find those resources for them, those things that they might need or, you know, just different things that in the community that exist that they don't know exist or they do know, but they don't know the language. So they're kind of hesitant. You know, we can accompany them so that they feel comfortable, not only um, just with the language, the language barrier, but also just having somebody there that you can trust that you know, we'll relay the message as it is or the information as it is. Um, just having somebody there with you is a type of comfort in itself. We're talking with Cynthia Barcella, Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door Clinic. You're tuned to KFUG Crescent City, 101.1 on your FM radio dial worldwide on the Internet, kfugradio.org. So, Cynthia, let, let me ask this, and I'm asking it for a couple of very specific reasons. Okay. So I'm, I'm assuming that some of the people who come to your office at Open Door are undocumented. I, I'm assuming that's the case. So two questions. One is, if, if that's true, mm -hmm. how do you assist them? Mm -hmm. Because I, I hear a lot of people who rant and rave about all of these undocumented people getting all of this free stuff, which, as I understand it, if you're undocumented, you don't qualify for any of that health care assistance or any of those things. Does that make sense yes, what I'm asking? Yes, it does. And, and so what's the reality of that situation? So just to be very, very clear, um, a person that is undocumented in the United States um, does not qualify for um, CalFresh, which would be um, like food stamps. Um, they don't qualify for Medi-Cal, which is Medicaid. Um, they don't qualify for, basically, they don't qualify for anything. Well, that's my understanding. Yes, and that's, I just want to make that very clear. Um, a lot of people don't know that, and that's a huge misconception that they receive. 
um, you know, and, and they don't. They don't qualify for basically anything. Um, and so when somebody comes into our office and they do need some type of health care or um, some type of guidance with their bills and stuff like that, um, the only reason we, we, we usually don't even ask if people are documented. So if there is somebody in the community that isn't documented and they want help, but they're hesitant because of their status, there's no need to be. So that's just not a question that yeah. you ask. Okay. No, that's, right. that's not a question that, they ask, that we ask. Um, the only time that we would ask is if we're applying with health insurance, because that's one of the questions on the application itself. Got it. Um, but personally, we don't ask. We don't care. We won't ever tell anybody. Um, so we, we want to make sure that that's very clear, that the community um, feels welcome coming in, whether they have a legal status or not. We're here to help you regardless. Um, and But yeah, we, we would only ask that question if it comes up in any type of application that they are um, filling out. Um, but most of the time, it doesn't. It doesn't really come up. Okay. I, I I think for me, the main thing that I really wanted to do is to have someone on who knows mm -hmm. to actually confirm that this trope that gets thrown around about all of these undocumented people who are getting all this free stuff are actually not getting any of that stuff. No, they're not. They, they themselves cannot receive anything. Uh, a term that I recently heard um, that I didn't even know existed was something called an anchor baby. Yes, and yes, I've heard that term. Yes, yes. and so what that term means is that um, the a person who's undocumented themselves, they can't receive anything, but their children, if they were born in the U.S., they can receive um, benefits. Um, and so that's, you know, the term is the anchor baby, that that's their anchor to, you know, receiving right. assistance. Um, but again, that assistance would be for the child. So the child would be receiving health care. Um, the child would be receiving any benefits are for the child. They're not for for the the parent. Right. And, and for all of those people who are really strict constitutionalists when it comes to things like the Second Amendment, it's in the Constitution that, like, if you're born on U.S. soil, you're a citizen. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so it's like the law. So when you start ranting about the Second Amendment and how it's in the Constitution, also remember that there are other things in the Constitution that are equally as foundational to this way this society operates. We're talking with Cynthia Barcello, Latino Outreach uh, Coordinator for, uh, for Open Door Clinic. <sighs> Cynthia, we've got, I don't know, you know, 10 minutes left. And I also know you're, you do some work because you're on the First Five Commission. And, and I'd like to have you talk a little bit about that and then i want to ask you a, a a little bit of a broader question about latino participation in the social economic political climate of our community and particularly long, younger latino people so but you are on the first five commission yes yes i am on the first five commission i'm still fairly new i'm to the position but i'm excited to show up <laughs> <laughs> um i was able to be the photographer at um first five's birthday party um, and that was great. I got to see a lot of people in the community and their wonderful, gorgeous children and those just really nice smiles. Um, uh, next week, I will be going to Sacramento for Advocacy Day. Um, and I'm looking forward to having a bilingual story time uh, with first wife Jennifer Siebel Newsom. She's going to be reading us a story. Um, I'm super excited to do that. Um, and there was one specific program that I wanted to talk about from First Five. It's called Ready for K. Um, it's a texting program that helps parents um, get their kids ready for kindergarten and beyond. Um, you can sign up online at www.dalnortkids.org. Um, and that's under the resources tab. Um, or you can go into uh, the Family Resource Center. Um, and that's at 494 Pacific Avenue. Um, I personally use this app, uh, this texting service um, for both of my children. My daughter is five years old um, and, I'm, and I receive her information um, and I'm receiving it in English for her. And, you know, 
it's really great because you get to involve your child. Um, hey, do you want to help me separate the laundry in different colors? Wonderful. What different colors do we have? You know, and, and so it really gets you uh, going and active with your children. Um, and I recently just actually signed up for um, the app in Spanish. So now I'm receiving Spanish for my son who is eight months old. So his activities are coming to be, to me in Spanish. Um, for me, it's really important for my children to be bilingual. Right. Hopefully they'll, you know, take the reins and be trilingual. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll help them with the bilingual stuff. And um, for me, I've noticed that sometimes it's a little bit difficult to bring in um, the Spanish. I'll just go off in English and start telling stories and, you know, just have our conversations in English. And then my daughter will stop me and say, hey, mom, how do you say this word in Spanish? And I'm like, oh, Spanish. OK, let's th- let's speak Spanish for the you know next half day. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, is there is there is, is there actually such a thing as Spanglish? <laughs> oh, definitely. We speak Spanglish all the time. <laughs> I've been speaking Spanglish since about age three. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and it's 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 really funny the way that it works. Um Especially with having a very curious five-year-old, um, she'll say there's certain words that she only knows in Spanish, and she's like, "Mom, how do you how do you say that in English?" Like, right. you know, and it's it's really great to see her um, differentiate now. Like, okay, this is Spanish and this is English, and sometimes I mix both of them, but it's okay. <laughs> sure, absolutely. We're talking with Cynthia Barcelo. She is on the First Five Commission here in Del Norte and also the Latino Health Coordinator for Open Door Clinic. So, Cynthia, I mean, this is a much bigger topic. I know it is, but I do want to ask you a little bit of Latino people in our community, particularly younger Latino people in our community, and involvement in community life, economic life, political life, how that's happening, how it could be better, um, more effective. Uh, and, and particularly, I'm thinking of younger people and younger people of diverse backgrounds really getting involved in, in our, our elected offices and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? What yes, I'm, yes. Um, yeah, it's exciting to see younger the younger generation getting involved. Um, I spoke at the um, Youth Training Academy last year, and I spoke a little bit about you know I'm um, getting involved, and it's amazing to see these you know younger kids still in high school, you know, ready to you know be involved politically and be involved with the community, and just to see them you know being prepared and trying to learn as much as possible to make those changes that need to happen. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely something that, you know, I, I want to see, um, more in our community, um, people of color, you know, stepping up to the plate and, you know, not, not allowing, um, people who don't know of our background, who don't understand, you know, where we're coming from to continue to represent us, um, because they're not really necessarily doing their job in representing us. They don't understand our story. Um, and, you know, so we, we definitely do need more young people who are thinking about my children's future to be representing, re- representing us. And, 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 and maybe coming at that from a different angle, not being that young person. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know we, guys and gals, we can step back a little bit. You know what I mean? And make some room for some folks. It's okay. <laughs> Like, like, Cynthia's not scary. Take my word no. for it. <laughs> Just don't mess with my children. Well, there's that. Yeah. Well, that, no, no, no. That's that's a different story now. So we've been speaking with Cynthia Barcelo. She's the Latino health coordinator for Open Door Clinic. Cynthia, in the two minutes we have left, mm-hmm. any final thoughts or contact information that you want to give out again? Yes, absolutely. Um, so like I said, you can find us in member services. Um, at Del Norte Community Health Center, also known as Open Door Clinic. Um, my, self, my phone number there is 707-465-1988, extension 6502. 
Um, if you would like to become, uh, you know, a, a table at one of our health fairs or if, you know, you're seeking services, you can definitely reach out to me. Um, if you're wanting to promote any, you know, um, resource that would benefit the community, definitely reach out to us. And, um, you know, we, we love to receive any information that we can, you know, and, and have that um, information ready for our patients, our clients when they come in, um, seeking those services. And for people who were rushing to grab that pen and yes. paper, give that information out one more yes. time, please. So that phone number again is 707-465-1988. And my personal extension is 6502. Cynthia Barcella, thank you so much for being with us on Public Process today. I really hope that you'll come back because all of the issues that we've talked about today certainly deserve more discussion and new things will come up. And we hope to have you on again. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. Thank you.